Okay, so I want to look at this slide. Um, so this is one of my very favorite proteins because it is an interesting example of inorganic chemistry, the stuff we study in Gen Chem, fused with biology. And I've always been fascinated how the metals in our body are so important. So we talked about osmosis and how the shape of a blood cell matters. Here's why. As it turns out, there are four reaction centers inside of the dip, inside of the dip of the red blood cell. Each of those have a group called a heme. It's an iron surrounded by um, a ring of like nitrogen and carbon. So there's four of those. Turns out those are responsible for holding oxygen. And then of course the oxygen gets taken to the various parts of your body to be used. So this is an equilibrium system. It has to be reversible because if the oxygen stuck on the blood cell forever, you couldn't use it in your metabolism and your cells would die. So this is what happens. In the lungs where there's a comparatively high amount of oxygen, the reaction tends to go forward. When it gets to your organs, your, you know, brain, heart, whatever, muscles, um, I don't know how to say that, we'll just, we'll just call it organs, but realize that includes your, your muscles and stuff as well. In the organs, it goes back the other way. So in other words, we start with hemoglobin in the lungs, it adds four oxygens on from you breathing in, that forms product, which is just this oxygen adducted to the proteins. Then the blood cell moves to another part of the body where there is a lower oxygen level. So this is decreased. That's going to cause the reaction to shift back to the right. So it's like a big Le Chatelier's cycle in the body. So I had this student who um, was a missionary in Peru. And if you don't know anything about Peru, the mountains there are very, very, very high. And so there's a problem with that. If you just kind of imagine, here's a little sketch. Here's a little guy at sea level, or girl, I don't know, a person at sea level. Um, and here's a person in, on a really high mountain. Apparently not really high, if these are to scale, but you get the idea. Um, our atmosphere only goes out to a certain place, right? And so if you think about the amount of oxygen between the person at the sea level and the person on the mountain, there's a pretty big difference. So as it turns out, altitude sickness is caused essentially by a decreased amount of oxygen than the person is normally accustomed to. Um, so when you think about that, if your lungs are supposed to be a higher level of oxygen, but they're lower than they ought to be, you're not gonna have as far of a forward shift as you might need. And so there's less available oxygen in the body. And so there's actually two things that you could do to fix this, right? So um, mountain climbers for a very long time have used, have used canned oxygen, essentially. They take oxygen tanks up. You can't climb really, really tall mountains without using that, so it's just not enough. So you could, you could use tanks to increase the amount of oxygen. It's not the only solution, though. If you're in a sport that doesn't allow for increased amount of oxygen, you got to become a little more resourceful. So in cycling and riding bicycles, there was a period of time where cyclists would um, save their blood and use it during races when they were going up really high hills and mountains and so forth. So you could, you could take an oxygen tank or you could literally put extra hemoglobin into your system. So changing either one of the reactants will shift it back where you want the reaction to go. Uh, it's called blood doping. Maybe you've heard of it before. It's a clever way of using Le Chatelier's principle to be able to perform at the peak level. And by the way, another longer term solution is simply to, um, to do your exercises for a prolonged period of time under reduced oxygen conditions. And so people go train in, in Denver, Colorado, because it's up high, so the oxygen concentrations are lower. And eventually your body will figure out you need to make more hemoglobin, but this takes a long time. My student from Peru told me that she felt sick for like two or three months, like really sick, flu-like symptoms, if you will, because of the low oxygen levels, I'm really tired. Um, after a certain, a few weeks, it's different for each person, but after a while working and living there, she said suddenly she felt great. And the thing is, when she got home as a runner, 
discovered that she was much faster. She had longer endurance, um, didn't, didn't get out of breath as fast when she got home because her body had learned how to make extra hemoglobin. And so the body will eventually catch up to this problem too. It just takes time. Um, of course, once you get back down to your sea level or, or wherever you live, it will eventually figure out it doesn't need the extra hemoglobin because hemoglobin is really expensive energetically to make. So the body really doesn't want to make extra if it doesn't need it. But so that's how you can man manipulate um, using Le Chatelier's principle. So um, this is going to go in the learning check. I want you to fill in these things. Um, if I add more of reactant B, what happens here? If we add more A, what happens here? If we take away some AB, what happens? And finally, how could we make it go left? There's probably a few answers to that question. <laughs>